Hi, I'm Rick Dior, and today we're going to talk about how I make drumsticks. Now, I'm not going to show you everything. There's obviously some trade secrets, but a lot of you have asked me about the process, how I choose my wood, where I get my wood, how I cut the wood, how we go about it. And I know a lot of you have bought sticks. I've actually never sold as many sticks as I have in the last six months or so. So I wanted to make sure you knew what you were getting and, and that I do it all myself and I make them from scratch. So here you have uh, some raw wood. This is persimmon and this is a tree that I purchased about three years ago and I went and cut it up into slabs and these are the slabs and I have plenty more. I'll show you that later. I've gone through probably half of it cutting it up like I'm going to do today and getting it ready to make sticks. So there's lots of um, drying time that has to take place. After you cut the tree down, if it's a dead tree, which this was, I kind of make it a habit not to cut down live trees. And this tree had been dead for a couple years and it was on someone's property and I had seen it. And I asked him if he ever wants to sell it, let me know. And he did. And we cut it down and we cut it up. And then I carted it over here uh, to the North Carolina mountains. I have a house up here near uh, Lake Lore, which is about 40 minutes from Asheville. And it's a great place to work, sun all the time, quiet. Uh, so I have a shop here as well as in Charlotte. I also have a duplicate smaller lathe, which is right here. Hopefully you'll be able to see that at the angle of this camera, that I can do a little bit of uh, finishing work on here up here. We'll show you that later as well. So anyway, we start out with these slabs which have to dry. I normally let the the wood dry for a year after I get it if it's not dry already and it has to be at least six percent it takes a lot to get a wood to dry that you know that much sometimes it could take a really really long time unless you have a good kiln I do have sort of a kiln in my garage where I stack stuff up use a uh, dehumidifier and, and um, wait for it to dry. So this wood is very dry now. It's actually at 5%. Now what happens when persimmon dries, it tends to check and bow. So you'll see at the end of this slab right here, and we'll turn it around, this is very heavy wood. So you see that, how it's curved there? Down. So it curves like that because when it dries, there's really nothing you could do. I put cinder blocks and sandbags and really heavy things on it. But again, with this wood, it has a mind of its own. So it's going to curve, which makes it hard to cut. Uh, but once you make the stick, it's totally fine. It's totally stable. But when it dries, it does that. So this is the kind of slab right here that I would probably reject and save this for last when I'm just about out of wood or I'll make a bench out of it. I make wood benches. Uh, I have them all over the property here. <laughs> okay, and this right here is a good one. You can probably see the end of it, how it's pretty flat. So that's important because when you cut it down on the table saw and then you make a dowel, which is what you have to do first, it makes it a lot easier to do that. Uh, you can actually, making the dowels is dangerous work because you have to use a drill, drive it through a doweling jig and if it's a little warped it can get stuck and literally twist you around because you have to use a really powerful drill and there's other ways to make dowels on the table saw and stuff but it's very slow I've tried all the different ways this jig is the best it's just a little temperamental so you want to pick the flattest piece of wood now if you're buying your wood if you're outsourcing it chances are it'll already be dry you know you want to check that you can get a moisture meter and check it but once again at least six percent if you don't want your drumsticks to warp uh, 20 years ago I learned that the hard way so make sure you do that so what we're gonna do is I'm gonna show you how I uh, draw this out and cut it and how I cut it on the table saw to make my squares and then we'll go back to the shop in Charlotte at some point and I'll film a little video of how I make a dowel and then I'll show you some rough stuff on the lathe just so you have an idea of what goes into this so stand by we'll be right back so I've taken that other piece away I've put it away and I've put this piece that I'm going to use on the tables here and I'm getting ready to cut it now in all of this wood we'll take this off here 
the middle of the tree is called heartwood. And that's the hardest part of the tree. And if you can see it, I know we're in direct sunlight here, but if you can see right here how it's darker, all this is the heartwood. Okay, and it varies from piece to piece, obviously. When you cut up the tree, you're cutting it through kind of a, uh, you know, a portable sawmill, and you're cutting it in slabs. So, so there'll be some uh, heartwood on some pieces and none in the other because you're cutting from the outside all the way through the tree, kind of, you know, you're, you're cutting it up into slices. So this particular piece has a lot of heartwood, and that'll give me the heaviest wood of the whole tree by about maybe 10 grams a stick or more sometimes. So normally, you know, a 55 gram stick or 60 gram stick is what persimmon will yield. The heartwood will yield a 70 gram stick and more sometimes. So it's pretty precious in this. And persimmon trees are not real big. This is the biggest tree I've ever seen, persimmon. So there's kind of a lot of heartwood in this one, but usually they're small fruit trees. So you're not going to get a lot of heartwood. So hopefully I'll be able to use this to make some heavy, very heavy persimmon sticks. So what I do is I clamp it to the benches, and then I take a T-square, and I've already cut the ends, and I spared you that. <laughs> and you, you just cut the ends with uh, a circular saw, all right? The ends are, are here. And I do that before I let the wood dry so uh, it doesn't bow and and check, which means cracking. So I paint the ends with a special compound that keeps that from happening. Sometimes I put wax on there. So you take the T-square, and then I, I have the six-foot level. I usually cut my pieces uh, about six feet, roughly. And then I'll put this level on there, and then just draw a line straight across. Now, for those of you who are woodworkers out there, you just can't pop this on the table saw. It's dangerous. This wood's extremely heavy. Also, the bark, it, it just falls off. So you have to have a straight edge to start with, and that's what I'm doing. So I cut one straight edge. I don't do both. Now, if I was going to make cabinets or some furniture, which I've done with this wood, and it's beautiful, then I'd put it on the joiner and the planer, square everything up. Uh, I usually cut my slabs anywhere from one and a half inches to, um, to two inches wide. And that way, when it shrinks up, I don't lose too much, and I can still get, you know, five-quarter or three-quarter pieces out of there. Now, for the drumsticks, you're going to need to start with at least an at least, uh, inch and a half piece. So you can put it on the table saw and square it up. That's really important. There's no planing involved. There's no joining involved. It's just doing this, cutting it with the compound miter saw you see in back of me there, and then putting it on the table saw and making your squares. Now let's talk real quick about safety equipment because I've been building structures and furniture and sticks for years and years and I've had pretty much everything happen to me except cutting off one of my fingers so I'm really careful but I've broken ribs when I've gotten kicked with a piece of wood from a table saw. I've almost fallen off a roof twice, came pretty close. So falling off of ladders, I'm pretty clumsy. So Try to avoid that by using safety equipment. So I'm a real stickler for that. Always use a mask. This dust can, can kind of mess up your lungs. Always use some sort of protective glasses. I think we spoke about this when I was doing the drum cleaning video. You don't want to get anything in your eye. That's a whole mess there. And then also use the most powerful saw that you can get. And I suggest using saws without cords. Uh, most of the problems I've had with getting hurt have taken place because of cords. So all my tools now, I've gotten rid of all my corded tools, and I use all battery-operated tools, powerful ones. This is a DeWalt worm saw. It's a heavy framing construction saw. This thing will cut through anything, and I have a really large battery. It's a 60-volt, 9-amp uh, battery. So there's more power here than I need, and that's what you want. So you want to make sure that this thing is cutting like butter because any kind of um, problem, it'll kick back, and that's when you can get hurt. Use a very, very sharp blade. I use a fine blade. There's actually 80 teeth on, on this blade. Um, so 
as fine as I can get it. It's more of a finishing blade, but again, it's, it's very, very sharp. And it is a ripping blade, so that, that's important too. All right. Now, sometimes you can use a blade with less, less teeth. That's kind of a framing blade. Uh, I just want these edges to be really smooth so I don't have to lose more wood. Now, there is a lot of waste that you'll have with any kind of wood because of any kind of knots. Uh, this particular tree does not have too many knots, which are branches, really, which is great. Uh, it does have a lot of bark, though, and the bark runs in funny directions. So I'll have to move in a little to make my first cut. So I'm going to show you how I do that. Now, I do that freehand, so I'll draw a line, and I'll just follow the line. I'm pretty good at that. I can cut pretty straight uh, with this thing. All right, so we'll make our line first, and what you do is you just take your T-square, put it on an edge that's, that's somewhat square, and then you go in enough so you could bypass the bark on the other side, which is pretty deep. And then basically you just draw your line. Now you see it looks like I'm going to lose a lot of wood, but that's because the piece isn't straight, obviously. So let's draw this line. Now once again, remember, this is the hardest North American hardwood. It's harder than hickory. And hickory is a hard wood. So, you know, it's dangerous to cut this stuff. <coughs> Excuse me. So be really, really, really careful and go nice and slow when you're doing it. If you smell burning, that means you need to use a different blade, more powerful saw. All right? If it jams, which it might when I'm cutting now, you just never know, because the wood runs funny. The first cut, the edge cut's the most difficult. Stop. <laughs> you don't want to force it through, okay? So I'm going to put on some of this protective gear real quick. Always make sure you feel under so you're not going to cut your table. I've done that too. <laughs> All right, we're ready to go. All right, so that went nicely. Uh, good cut. You saw where it kind of hung up there a little. That was the heartwood it hit. So the heartwood ran out there. And I don't know if you could see that. I'll hold it up. Clamp off. There was a little knot and then the hardwood. But you see how straight that is. Now, there are some wormholes. Uh, wormholes are like beetles uh, that infest some of these trees. Uh, wormy chestnut is a beautiful one. I've used that to make furniture. It's got all kinds of things. So that's part of the character. Now, on a drumstick, you can't use that. There'll be a hole in the stick. So you cut around that. So once again, there's a lot of waste. Now, the next step I'll do is I'll go over to this compound sliding miter saw, put that on there, and cordon it off. And we're going to cut 22-inch pieces from this. That's normally the length I start with because there's going to be waste on, on either end. So we'll be back with that. So I put the camera back on because I got a decision to make here. And this is one of the things that you're going to run into. So what happened here when I started laying it out, measuring it, I know there's going to be waste on either end. Usually there's some checking, again, which means cracking, on either end of these pieces of wood. But there is a knot here, like I showed you before. That's where the saw got hung up. And that's going to be unusable. Also, though, that's where the heartwood is. It, it, there's not much here, so I have to make a decision if I'm going to use this part and cut this off or go up to there. So I think I'm going to try to use as much of this heartwood as possible. Therefore, I'm going to cut it a little shorter, 22, 22, 22 instead of 24. And then what I, I'm going to have to be real careful when I make that dowel 
that uh, I have some extra working room. Because again, the dowel, the, the start and the end usually gets a little funky. So we'll, we'll map that off here and see what that looks like. We could also go from this end, but then this would be waste. So I haven't even done this yet, so I'll show you how I do it. So that's 22. All right. Good. Six, six. All right, almost perfect. So I am going to cut out this because there's a knot there. That would be waste. And there's also a crack here. I'm sure you can't see it. So this is where we're going to cut off. And that will work. I'll be able to use the whole piece of wood. In other words, every square I use, since it's pretty clear, will be usable. And that's a lot. Probably get, I don't know, maybe uh, 20 pairs of sticks from this. Now again, once you put stuff on the lathe, I, I said this in another, uh, my drumstick video, the second one, sometimes there's just dead wood in there for whatever reason. The, uh, the particular piece of wood just has a dead spot, so there's waste there. So my point is there's always a lot of waste. So if you spend money on a piece of ebony, a lot of money, and you get it, you think you're going to use all of it, you're not. There's usually no way. There's usually going to be a good bit of waste. So financially, these are things you need to think about when, you, when you're wanting to do things like this. Same goes for cabinetry. You know, there's always some wood that you can't use for particular reasons, so build that into your budget. All right, so now we got it laid out, and we're going to take it over to the other saw. So now I have this on the sliding compound miter saw. It's called sliding because it slides, and this is a 12-inch version. Uh, this is the tool I use most in the whole shop, besides the table saw, which I use a lot. Uh, it's, it's not too dangerous if you're careful, and um, it works really, really well for cutting all kinds of angles. This will do up to 60 degrees, but for this it's perfect because it's very, very powerful, and it'll cut through this wood very easily. And also, I have a pretty heavy table, rolling table, that I use for it, so you always want to do that. Now, you also want to wear some steel tip boots because if something happens, uh, it'll fall on your toe and crush your toe. That's also happened to me. <laughs> so be, you know, be sure you do that. So we'll put on this stuff and we'll start slicing this up. I start in the middle. I don't do an end first because it's uneven and it's liable to tip over. So, that, that went pretty well, obviously. Now, what you have to remember is, a lot of times these pieces are big, so the saw won't go all the way through. So I have a little saber saw here that I can use to finish out the cut. All right? Also, all this bark is going to go once I put it on the table saw. As you saw there, when I first start to cut, I don't go all the way through. Because if the wood is warped or if the, the, the grain is, is all over the place, which it is in persimmon, the, the saw will jam. So I'll just do a first a cut that goes about, I don't know, three quarters of an inch halfway through this piece of wood. And then, if everything seems good, then I'll just finish it out like I did. So you saw two cuts there. That's why I recommend it. Otherwise, you get kicked. Okay? So what we're going to do now is we're going to take this... Let's see if it cut through. It did. So we'll take this off. And now, now you can manage all this on the table saw. All right? So we'll put this over here. And then we're going to cut one more piece off of here. And you don't need to see that. So we're going to shut the camera off, save some batteries. And then the next stop will be the table saw. 
Okay, so I cut these pieces up, you see them here, into three separate pieces, and the last one I leave as long as possible, just in case I can get some more out of it. Uh, persimmon actually makes great firewood, and I have wood stoves in both my houses, so uh, I'll use this to actually heat my house, whatever I don't, whatever waste I have. It stuff burns hot and long, so uh, it's... Um, it's great firewood if, if you ever need to know that. Okay, good. So we're going to start here with the table saw. Now what I've done was I cut a square. This is how I do the dowels. And that's how they come out. And so I have a blank and I can use that as a template to get my width, which is roughly around 7 eighths. And you'll see that when we do the dowel machine. Okay, so I'll just take the fence here and I'll move it right to the blade where this dowel is. Now the blade I'm using here is a Freud uh, ripping blade, and it's, it's pretty much the best one they make. is a $120 blade. Uh, it's important on a table saw. This is, most injuries in woodworking uh, happen on a table saw. People losing fingers. Uh, that and the joiner, which I rarely use anymore because it's so dangerous. Uh, certain tools are safer than others. The table saw can be a bad one. Safe ones include the band saw, the scroll saw. You know, those things are fairly safe. you got to work pretty hard to, to hurt yourself on those. But the table saw can kick you uh, if something comes back. If you don't use the safety features on it, I, I've actually broken two ribs like that. Got kicked with a piece of plywood that did not have uh, the teeth on there and the blade guard. So this was years and years ago, and I'm much, much more careful now. Because as you know, when you break ribs, you can't do anything about it. You just got to wait it out until <laughs> they heal. So I'm really careful, and again, the table saw is extremely dangerous, so always be careful. It will kick back, especially with a wood as hard as persimmon or hickory, or obviously leopard wood or wengi. Those are even harder than persimmon, so you've just got to be careful. So what we'll do now is we'll start cutting this up. I'll show you a little of that on camera. Use a push stick, and since I have a straight edge now here, that's the edge that I put on the saw like that. So we'll take these other pieces off. And I'll do a couple cuts just so you can see how I do this. Now remember, you see how warped that is, okay? That means one side of the cut is going to be uneven. So after I do the first cut, I have to turn it over and do another cut to make it somewhat square so it fits in my socket to make my dowel, which I'll show you in, at another time in another shop. Okay, so let's put all this stuff on. And once again, always use the safety stuff, especially for the table saw. Hopefully you'll be able to hear me with this thing on. We've all gotten used to that, right? So you want to stand off to the side. Don't stand right in front of it. That's how, when I was stupid, I, I hurt my ribs. Of course, it was plywood, so I didn't have much place to go. So then always use your fence, okay? Fence system, safety system, blade guard is what that's called. And uh, by the way, this is a 220 volt saw. Very, very powerful. Use the most powerful saw you can afford. You might have to wire your electrical box like I did uh, to use it, you can easily do that. But uh, don't do it yourself if you, don't, if you don't know what you're doing. But the most powerful saw is a must for these hardwoods. Or the saw will jam and overheat. Or again, you can, you can hurt yourself. So be careful. There we have our piece of wood, a little tiny bit of burning. That's going to happen. And, that, and that's the end I did over there. Now you see how, it's, how it looks like this. See, it's not straight. But what I'm going to do is go back and do it from the straight edge like that. So that's all going to be waste. I'll do it right now so you can see it.
you see that's what I cut off. And I, sometimes I use this to make little pieces of furniture or whatever. But now that's pretty square. That'll fit. All right. That's pretty much it. That's how I make my blanks. And then this either goes on the lathe or in a dowel maker. And then I can make a dowel. Sometimes it goes on the lathe if I'm making a thicker stick. So there you have it. And then I'll cut all this stuff up. It takes me a day. I usually cut, you know, probably five or six slabs. Uh, takes about uh, 45 minutes each to do it right. And then I have my blanks. I make my blanks, let these dry, make sure they're stable, measure them again with the moisture meter, and uh, make my dowel and put them on the lathe and make a stick. And we'll show you that. Uh, maybe later today I'm going to finish some sticks here. I'll show you a little of that. But, um, you know, this is going to be in several parts in a couple different shops. So I hope you enjoyed this. And if we don't add to the video, uh, we'll just see you next time. Thanks. I almost forgot to show you. Here is the persimmon that I have left, which I have not manufactured into these dowels and these rods that I was showing you. And there's a good bit left, but I've gone through half of it already. So it's going fast. <laughs> and that's how I, I dry it. That's called stickering. You're putting sticks in between. You let air flow in there. And I'll let it sit like that for a year. In the summer, I put a dehumidifier in here and I let it run full time. And at first, when you cut the tree up and you put it in here, it's extremely wet. It's got a very strong smell. And a few times you've seen moisture on the actual concrete coming from it. But after about six months, it's, it's fairly dry. And then it gets down to 10%, stays like that for quite some time. And then it takes about another six months to get down to six or even 5%. And that's perfect. Now you see the checking here. Even, even though I've put this protection on there, it still checks. And that's the nature of persimmon. There's a lot of waste. It's a very finicky wood because it's so hard. That's the piece that we didn't use. I'm going to make a bench out of this. Perfect contour for my big butt. <laughs> All right.